Mercilly Benedict is a sculptor, writer, and lecturer whose research-based work digs into the cracks of global, social, ecological, and industrial systems. In uncovering these vulnerabilities or weaknesses, she seeks new alternatives and, through the process, exposes her own vulnerability in unexpected encounters, exchanges, and reactions. She describes her practice as one of active observation, engagement, instigation, and experimentation. For the last three years, Benedict has produced a series of video installation works in collaboration with her partner, David Reuter. Their project, Gary Streetlights, received a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts through the Legacy Foundation. Their forthcoming work, Dimensions of Citizenship, will screen later this year at the US Pavilion in the Venice Architecture Biennale. Benedict received a BFA from the Rhode Island School of Design and an MFA in Sculpture from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. She currently lectures at the University of Oregon in Sculpture and Fiber. Her work has been exhibited nationally and internationally, most recently here in Chicago at the Renaissance Society, which some of our students were able to see a couple weeks ago. The Museum of Contemporary Photography, Expo Chicago, the DePaul Art Museum, Three Walls, and the Hyde Park Art Center, the Ski Club in Milwaukee, Hauser and Wirth in the UK, and at Contemporary Art Brussels in Belgium. She has participated in numerous national and international residencies, including Artport Tel Aviv and the Banff Center's Research and Culture on Energy Residency. Please join me this morning in welcoming Marissa. Thank you, Jackie, uh, for that lovely introduction. Uh, I travel a lot, I guess. Um, and also thank you, Mara, for the lovely invitation to be here, and all those who participated in the two workshops that we ran earlier today. Um, it's always fun to test out new ideas and things that I'm working on, and thank you all for being game, uh, for trying to shift scale and look at uh, some particulate matter. Um, yeah, and to the College of DuPage. It's, it's really lovely. I have not visited Glen Ellen, uh, and it's a gorgeous sunny day today. Um, so I'm going to focus myself today, uh, since we have about a little less than an hour, as I like to leave some room for questions and responses. Um, but I'm going to uh, talk about two projects rather than going through a lot of work. I want to focus on kind of two, um, two projects, and we'll see how much time that takes, and I might have to kind of cut, cut the second one short a little bit. Um, and I selected these two uh, because they really, to me, um, are about this body of research that myself and my partner um, have been engaging on uh, around dust and particulate matter, um, which we mean both literally dust, um, the, the material, the thing in the air, and then we also uh, kind of are taking dust as a metaphor to think about data and bits and bytes and small pieces of things and the ways that they move in the world. So I'm, I'm actually going to do something I don't usually do, um, and I'm going to um, screen for us um, about 10 or 12 minutes or so. I'm going to keep an eye on time um, of this video um, because I'd like you to just experience some of the work um, and get into it. Um, so it's a three-channel video installation um, that was shown at the Museum of Contemporary Photography in 2016. I talked about this exhibition with a few of you. Um, it was part of an exhibition called um, Pet Coke, Tracing Dirty Energy. And this was a new work that my partner David Ruder and I um, produced, particularly for this exhibition, um, as we were tasked to think about petroleum coke dust. And I'll talk a little bit more about what pet coke dust is and why we did what we did, but I'd like to just kind of first show you the video.
So, dust. <laughs> um, yeah, so hopefully that gave, I do like showing the work itself, um, to kind of give a feel of what I'm talking about. I use a lot of language in, in my work. I write a lot, um, but sometimes you need no language, and the sound and the feel of the thing uh, will do a lot more than talking about it. So it's, it's nice to screen uh, a part of a piece when I can. Um, but just to give maybe a little context for what you saw. Um, so uh, the piece is kind of uh, a science fiction, clearly, uh, but one that sits kind of just to the side of the present and um, really brings together a lot of kind of conditions and feelings that my partner David and I were talking about um, in thinking about a world in which we are all conceived of a bit more like molecules of dust um, by the larger economies um, in which we're supposed to be freelancers and uh, adjunct laborers and kind of move in really erratic um, ways. So that the kind of vignettes that you see in the video um, that are kind of around the labor of dust kind of come from, from some of that thinking. Um, and then the material itself. Um, uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about um, and kind of its inspiration, but I think it, the, the piece we also wanted to live within the show that was really specific um, to an environmental justice issue on the south side of Chicago, but then also expanded um, and provided um, metaphors um, kind of that, that connected um, a really local struggle with um, something kind of large and global and um, a bit more kind of abstracted as well. Um, so yeah, and I like, I like this quote, David and I were, the minute we started thinking about dust, uh, we started finding all of these texts, the minute you talk about dust, people, a lot of people have stories about dust, they come to you and tell you um, things that they've seen, uh, yellow, desert or yellow dust blowing over the Gobi Desert, you know, a, a storm that they saw um, at Owens Lake in California, there's kind of all of these, these stories of dust, both big and small. And uh, we also kind of, at the time, since we were thinking in the science fictional mode, um, or and science fiction and speculative, perhaps, um, I, I mean more speculative thinking, um, uh, this uh, philosopher and uh, writer, uh, Reza Negrestani, has this book called Cyclanopedia. And uh, it's kind of all about the Middle East and dust and oil, um, which was kind of very related to some of the research we were doing. I um, mean, there's this kind of terrifying quote that's, that we were using to kind of introduce the piece that said, breathe as deeply as you will, dust will never be depleted. And in a world where um, it feels like we're coming up against um, a sense of depletion of resources, of things, um, of materials, um, uh, this thought that the dust, the thing, the, the, the scale of matter that everything breaks down to in the end is never depleted, it continues to circulate, uh, was kind of a, a poetics that, that we were interested in, in talking about. Uh, so the piece is titled, I Can Only See Shadows. Um, and was part of this group exhibition um, in, 20, in the summer of 2016 um, called Petcoke, Tracing Dirty Energy. And it was a really interesting, uh, unique exhibition um, in that we were part of a group that actually uh, were commissioned a year ahead of time to make new work along with uh, these other artists in the show, people like Claire Pentecost and Brian Holmes and Rosalinda Borsila, a lot of Chicago-based artists, um, and a few international ones um, like Steve Rowell. Um, to think about um, a very specific issue of, of pet coke, um, this waste product that, that was on the south side of Chicago. So uh, having a year lead time and, and knowing the artists you work with, um, the curators very generously organized monthly meetings where we would meet with activists um, from the community, we would do site visits to the south side of Chicago and also um, be discussing the works with the other artists as they were developing. So this piece as well in the context of the show um, was probably the most speculative of the works. Um, a lot of the other pieces um, dealt more uh, kind of in activism and representing the struggles um, very specifically that um, were being fought against petroleum coke at the time um, and are still being fought. Um, but ours, we wanted to kind of, uh, since we felt that other artists were really kind of uh, carefully and clearly addressing um, a lot of that, that kind of work that we wanted to take a step elsewhere and see where we could go. Um, so I, I was going to just read a little, I think they, they phrase it better than I do, the kind of um, the history and the conditions of this exhibition. So I was going to just read a quick quote from the curator's uh, exhibition essay. 
Um, so from 2009 until early 2016, piles of dark, gritty dust loomed five stories high on the banks of the Calumet River on the southeast side of Chicago. Tar sands oil operations at the BP plant in nearby Whiting, Indiana, were piling up petroleum coke, or pet coke, a cheap and dirty energy source produced out of their waste. At a KCXB storage facility, a subsidiary of the coke industries, hills of pet coke the size and scale of the area's bygone factories had long supplanted thriving industry. The mounds lay so close to south side neighborhoods, in fact, that residents said on windy days, airborne particulates from the site drifted into their yards, coating their homes with a black dust. The world's largest oil companies and corporations, often referred to collectively as big oil, had turned the area into a local dumping ground for their operations. The community mobilized, with residents, activists, and organizers joining forces to educate and inform protests and ultimately move the needle on legislation. Today, although the mounds are gone due to hard-won legal battles, the activist fight continues. Petcoke Tracing Dirty Energy grew out of our desire to bring attention to the devastating environmental and public health impacts of Petcoke by understanding the oil industry as a whole. That kind of gives a bit of the, the political framing of the show. Um, and this piece was kind of situated in this political framing, but then uh, really wanting to kind of, um, yeah, push, push that and uh, think about the dust um, Again, it's kind of, yeah, very local, but then also spiraling into this um, larger narrative. Um, so for the, for the work, David and I wanted to actually trace. Um, we did a lot of research on what, what pet coke was, where it comes from. Um, and actually, this chart might show a little better. Um, but uh, the pet coke actually um, is a really particular um, dusty byproduct um, that is specific to the extraction processes of the Athabascan tar sands in Canada. Um, and I think if my mouse shows up, maybe not. Uh, it's the one very high up there uh, in the north of Canada. Uh, is where the, uh, it's the largest refining site uh, in the world, uh, active uh, kind of oil extraction site. Um, and if you look at it on Google Earth, uh, you can see just in enormous uh, fields. Um, the size of a small country, uh, which are just kind of for extracting oil sands. Um, and those oil sands are really heavy or dirty, as they call them. They're full of bitumen, um, which is kind of a black tar-like substance. And that bitumen, um, they put in huge pipes and they slurry it down uh, to Chicago. Uh, this is what the Keystone XL pipeline was kind of about, for those of you who, who followed that um, debate. And then in the Chicago, Indiana area, it's uh, refined into uh, different oil uh, and heavy substances. And then much of it is shipped down to the Gulf of Mexico, which you can see, and um, goes worldwide from there. Um, but otherwise, the pet coke itself, which is this kind of byproduct that they they uh, sell to burn as a fuel, um, and is also some, used uh, a bit in making aluminum and other uh, metals uh, and alloys. Uh, but um, that uh, they ship to China and India in particular um, because it is too dirty by EPA or what were EPA regulations to burn in the United States uh, as a fuel source for our power plants and other things. So this brought up a really interesting question for us um, about this kind of um, the global commons of the atmosphere, which is not something, and I, I like this world view, this kind of uh, view from space. Um, just kind of as we were looking at this dust product, product um, you know, it was, it was in literally the food and the lungs of the residents of Hegewish, Illinois, but then also um, in the lungs of uh, residents in Beijing um, as well. Um, so this kind of uh, connectivity um, and, and the shared um, a kind of, uh, yeah, the shared soup we're in, I could say, of this, this atmosphere. Um, and even the fact that uh, a student was, was talking to me about this as well, that uh, winds will often blow from one continent to the other. So dust is not something that um, really you can say is a localized problem. Its condition is to spread um, and to infect everything around it. Um, so this kind of, this, the global position was one that we were particularly interested in. So uh, David and I, to shoot uh, what you saw, um, traced that, um, the, the, the uh, routes of pet coke. We went to the Athabascan tar sands, we went to Beijing, and then the Gobi Desert as well to look at um, some of the dust there that mingles with pet coke, um, particulate matter in the air above Beijing. Um, 
and then we kind of, yeah, traveled all around Chicago, um, the Midwest, uh, to kind of look at all these different sites that um, related to this condition that we were looking at, um, a world in which dust kind of infiltrates the air um, and slows all movement in some way. It's thick, and the air becomes, you know, kind of a medium that, that we have to deal with and, and think about. Um, and then, of course, also in the video you saw in each of those kind of vignettes, we were working um, along the way with other artists, anthropologists, and researchers, um, kind of talking to them about their uh, research or their interest in dust. So each of those kind of vignettes are actually um, narratives that they proposed, um, and we kind of worked with them to shoot in the film um, as we were kind of, you know, talking to them about working on this project. Um, and then last, lastly, as I transition into the next, uh, work. I um, also uh, the piece very clearly I think um, puts forth these connections between dust and data, um, and this kind of new global uh, world of data that we're in. Um, and as you know, we kind of enter uh, this new technologic age. Um, it's really interesting that kind of the material resources that are extracted from the ground, of which oil and this pet coke product are part of. Um, in a lot of ways are becoming transformed into data. They're literally becoming the energy that fuels data centers. Um, and that the production, storage, and transmission of data also kind of consumes increasingly vast uh, forms of natural resources. Um, this thought that the internet is a cloud and that it's lightweight um, is kind of one of the fallacies that the tech industries really uh, want us to think. The cloud is an image of the internet, and really the internet is incredibly weighty. It's enormous data centers that if you have a chance, a lot of them are actually around here. They often sit in suburbs as um, kind of nondescript concrete buildings with no windows. If you see enormous nondescript concrete buildings with no windows, uh, there's a likelihood it's a data center, uh, particularly if it has a, a funny name about clouds or corporations. Um, uh, and so there's, there's these kind of large buildings, and then there's also all the kind of undersea cables, the infrastructure, the fiber optics, um, which Dave and I have also made work about, um, that really are uh, kind of the weight and materiality um, of the, the new technologic age. Um, and so this kind of, yeah, this, this trans transformation um, of, of materials to support data, but then also literally into data, the scanning of objects and things and producing them into images, um, which circulate is kind of um, something that will be and is kind of a defining um, mode of our time, as most of you know better than I, I think. Uh, so the, uh, the title of the, the piece, I Can Only See Shadows, um, comes actually from a Hito Steyrl essay, and I'm gonna uh, read a quote from her next as well. Uh, she's been kind of a formative, she's a video artist, um, and also a writer um, who publishes on platforms like Eflux. And the title is kind of out of her um, essay that also came out in 2016 called A Sea of Data, Apophenia, and Patter Pattern Misrecognition. And we're really interested in this thought that, um, you know, the, the ways in which we conceive of data as networks and lines and as logic, um, actually, if, like, can, like, is, a fallacy in many ways, the, the way things break apart and become dust um, and then recirculate uh, actually has a lot of possibility for noise and interference um, that becomes really interesting and the logic of things starts to become a bit more chaotic and complex um, when you look at things at the level of bits and bytes rather than um, as kind of whole objects or things um, as, they're, as they're circulated. Um, so uh, yeah, so from her, um, essay in this one about apophenia. She states that apophenia is the perception of patterns within random data. The most common examples are people seeing faces in clouds or the moon. Apophenia is about drawing connections and conclusions from sources with no direct connection other than their indissoluble perceptual simultaneity as Benjamin Bratton recently argued. So this, this thought that, um, or we were really interested in the sense that if you convert, or if we look at kind of data as dust and that as a form of communication, um, and this is all speculative, um, but that's kind of the fun of art. If we're not a bit mad, why not be? Um, but if it becomes this kind of uh, level of dust, there's, uh, all these possibilities for interference or noise or miscommunication or scrambled communications or even the dust itself trying to communicate something um, that you would never never have gotten to otherwise. Um, uh, so yeah, so this kind of uh, science, this speculation um, about this medium of dust um, 
that's kind of uh, dealing in possibilities of apophenia, which those kind of um, tablets that you see with the, the patterns that are being um, produced are, were a program that, that my partner, uh, David, wrote to kind of uh, imagine what it would be to read the dust for information, and then that is an economy in and of itself, and it's translated. Um, yeah, so there's a lot more I think I can go. The videos, <laughs> we spent a long time, over two years, kind of thinking and writing about this piece. Um, so I'm, I'm shortening it into about uh, 20 minutes here. Um, but yeah, I think, um, yeah, okay. So I'm gonna transition, I think, towards the, the next body of work, just to keep us on time. Um, okay, so uh, again, I just liked this Hito Styro quote um, that talks about kind of uh, the networked medium. And I'm just gonna read it as, we're, as I was thinking, or as we were thinking about kind of networks and networks as physical and um, technology and information as a physical thing. Um, Hito Shariel has a lot of great speculative writing that, that gets into this. And uh, in this essay, uh, Too Much World Is the Internet Dead? She says, network space is itself a medium, or whatever one might call a medium's promiscuous posthumous state today. But this space is also a sphere of liquidity, of looming rainstorms and unstable climates. It is the realm of complexity gone haywire, spinning strange feedback loops a condition partly created by the humans, but also only partly controlled by them. We thought it was a plumbing system, so how did this tsunami creep up in my sink? How is this algorithm drying up this rice paddy? Um, and I really like that as kind of a, a way to kind of think through these, these systems that um, we think we have control of, that we develop, and you know, these are very literal in many ways. Uh, agriculture is a logistic system that would grind to a halt. Uh, now without the computers that manage, the trucks that distribute it, the way we get our food is actually deeply integrated with, with uh, systems of data and algorithms. Um, if the computers crash, those, those lines break. So that thought that um, how, did this, how is this algorithm drying up my, ri my rice paddy is kind of, I think, one of the, the conditions that is really kind of profound to me today. Um, so I have, like, from all the reading and research I do, um, there's kind of these, these certain conditions that I think are also hopefully felt in the works that you see. Um, but I've been thinking a lot about these kind of different states, um, about aridity, acceleration, evaporation, uh, condensation, and concentration. <laughs> um, as kind of def uh, defining conditions that I feel as the world kind of, uh, and on my travels, uh, as I talk to a lot of people, but that, that things are spinning faster. And I'm from California as well, so this may be a particular um, California-centric perspective, but um, certain places in the world, and when I talk to climate scientists, are getting drier, others are getting wetter. There's this kind of volatility of things as they're pulling apart um, in the face of, of climate change. Um, and that's kind of one of the, the few things that, that climate scientists will speak to, um, that all of their, um, all of the, the models that they make really speak to this kind of volatility, the, the spiking up and down of things, that it, it's not a smooth curve, but that we're becoming um, kind of more separated and extracted. And I like this word arid to kind of talk about that. So for the show, um, the same time around 2016, I had written this, um, kind of a manifesto about aridity, and I think dust is something particularly arid. It literally, like, the video, I had a lovely person comment to me that it made their mouth feel dry. They feel like they felt the, the I Can Only See Shadows piece really kind of made the air thick in a weird way when they were watching it in the installation. Um, and so this kind of uh, drying out of things. Um, and. Uh, yeah, I'll read, this is my, again, I like these kind of speculative uh, mad places that you can, you can take these ideas. Um, uh, as we're talking about extremity, why not, why not push things uh, in the language as well? So uh, this, this piece that I wrote for the show, um, I was talking about aridity as a quality of lacking interest in life, of barrenness, of fruitlessness, fruitlessness of low productivity, of sterility. Water underlies all forms of value. Keep hydrated, keep liquid, keep flowing, keep wet. Aridity is volatile. It is the enemy of smoothly functioning networks, of predictable bumper crops, of the unrestricted exchange of capital, of the free flow of information. Aridity and its anxiety-inducing fluctuations spurs the creation of redundant backup systems and wide buffers, attempts to avert crash and collapse. 
Aridity is accelerating agitation. It is the frictional breaking of molecular bonds as energized by photons from the sun. Liquids become gaseous and pull apart, expanding and cracking the earth in a rapid exit towards the atmosphere. One of the primary effects of global warming, as described by atmospheric climate models and by observable patterns, is an increased volatility in water systems. Storms such as Hurricane Patricia swell in ferocity, even as they appear and dissipate at precipitated speeds. Sea levels rise and water evaporates out of places already considered deserts. Fog dissolves quickly in arid climates. Aridity is the result of humidity drawn elsewhere, a condition understood not by what is materially present, but what, by what becomes absent. Arid environments, extreme environments in general, erode boundaries, requiring life forms to either network and share valuable resources or to pour energy into strengthening barriers. Bubbles and biodomes abound in volatile circumstances, and organisms at every scale are observed to behave in their own resource-specific self-interest. And that last part I, I like because it um, kind of gets uh, to this, to one of the, the politics as well that I've, I've been very interested in um, is uh, in these kind of a seeming or these growingly extreme uh, climate circumstances, um, the ways in which either we network together and we share, we, we come together and, and we get ourselves out of the problem, um, which is a really powerful mode of action um, and was kind of demonstrated by the Pet Coke activists who kind of pulled their community together and fought a big corporation and, and kind of won that. Um, so, you know, when, when a time of crisis, do you come together or do you, you pull apart and you strengthen the boundaries and barriers between yourselves, you build walls um, and you hold your own property or resources separate? Um, so that I'm getting my way towards this work that I think some of you visited at the Renaissance Society, um, which... Uh, it has a long title, <laughs> but it's a, a sculptural installation, and I kind of wanted to just briefly frame it um, so I, I keep to time um, around these kind of models of containment. And I think there's kind of three, three different forms of containment that I was observing. Um, but the work came out of about three years' worth of research, visiting, looking at, thinking about um, these reservoir sites in Los Angeles and in Israel. Um, those are the kind of two, two places I've connected at the moment, um, but they, they have larger global connections as well. Um, but I'm, I'm from the Southern California area, and um, I'll just quickly, for context, uh, just to give you some of the images while I, I talk. So this is actually a video that is not yet done, which is really rare to show you guys work in progress, <laughs> but this, this is work in progress. Um, but uh, I became really interested in this weird phenomena uh, of shade balls. I don't know if any of you saw this video that went viral. Um, the LA Department of Water and Power was kind of promoting this, but they poured 96 million uh, black hollow plastic balls on five reservoirs in Los Angeles uh, in 2012 or so. Um, and the purpose of these supposedly was to uh, prevent water from evaporating was what, what they talked about in the press releases. Um, the Los Angeles area and California in general, I think as maybe many of you have heard, um, are in like a deep water crisis, but um, this was kind of the, the immediate cheapest um, solution that they, they came up with with covering these reservoirs. And also later I, I found out that another, another major reason is it's illegal to have them uncovered because of the dust that blows into them and the other particulate contaminant that, that particularly as the landscape dries out around the reservoir uh, can enter the reservoir. So they created these ridiculous kind of uh, dusty, uh, or these <laughs> literally particle shade covers that um, I kept staring at because they're sculpture to me. Um, they're kind of very uh, literally um, like smart technologies, but they're, they're also kind of stupid. They're like a big ball pit, right? They're something you would see at Chuck E. Cheese's and they're really funny. Um, but they're also really serious. They're kind of about water management and about a public resource that um, they're scared about and they're increasingly clamping down on um, in kind of a, a mode uh, which I've been following, uh, the kind of increasing price of water, which also means that water becomes more privatized. It doesn't become a resource for everyone. It becomes a resource for those who can afford it, which is also a really uh, scary and, and difficult proposition. Um, so that's kind of, I think, landscape. And then these particle clouds, which um, I 
don't think we got to the end of the last video. There is one that we also made for the pet coke. Um, come from the kind of drone images that, that I was taking. Um, and I've kind of also been interested in, in literally taking the images and, and producing these particle clouds out of it. Um, just as kind of thinking through the different ways in which um, I'm, like particulate matter uh, comes into focus. Okay, so I think I'm going to not spend too much time on this one, but yeah, so um, I think it's just kind of interesting to having shown you guys um, a video to show you um, essentially kind of like a three-channel sculpture <laughs> um, as compared to the three-channel video. Um, and uh, this installation at the Renaissance Society, I really wanted to focus on these kind of um, three elements of the reservoir and their relationships to each other um, and how I might communicate these modes of um, containment or attempts at containment. Um, so there's the fence, um, which is a little hard to see in the photo, but it's kind of a nine foot tall fence that runs into the wall of the Renaissance Society um, and kind of really merges into the architecture um, so that it, it feels like um, the fence uh, is kind of encircling you, even though it's just a bit or a fragment of the fence. And I really wanted to also put these kind of components of the reservoir situation in their proper relationships, if that makes sense. Like the fence is a perimeter. It, it's kind of um, mapping itself onto the outside wall of the gallery um, and merging into that architecture. And it also puts you, the viewer, inside of the fence where the water usually is. It's, it's turned so it faces outward. Um, and kind of just thinking about who has access to resources. And this is installed at the University of Chicago, which is kind of, yeah, a very wealthy private university. Um, and those who have access to resources are the kinds of people who would, who would often visit a gallery like this. Um, and then the other two components, the shade balls themselves. Um, I went through a whole process sourcing these from China um, and having them imported. Um, and I realized at some point that they're actually filled with Chinese air because they're perfectly enclosed um, plastic balls, um, which I also think is kind of fascinating that air is being used to hold down water encapsulated in this kind of plastic membrane. There's a kind of poetics that we're importing Chinese air to keep our water held. Um, and then I, I went on this kind of whole, and I'm just going to skim ahead here um, to make this fast, and we're going to not watch those videos. Um, this whole kind of process of um, these water bottles, which were uh, a way that I also wanted to present the water, but I wanted it contained. I wanted it away from you, um, just as kind of in these reservoir situations, um, I could never get to the water. The water always had to go through um, a tap or kind of come through a private house. Um, in the kind of that form we all know now, the water bottle that is kind of the, the growing ubiquity um, of the circulation of water. Um, and these water bottles also for me, um, I don't know if any of you know the artist Hans Hacke, but in the 1960s there was kind of a, he made these beautiful condensation cubes and they're very much like that. Um, okay, yeah, so anyways, the water bottles also were kind of just technical wise I'm running out of time, um, but it was kind of a really fascinating exploration um, to me that I ended up working with plastic um, in my search for water. Plastic kind of became the material that, that I, I was using, uh, both in the shade balls and then in these, these water bottle forms. Um, and I wanted to blow my own three gallon water bottles um, just to kind of understand what the process of containment was about. So I ordered these, um, they're called preforms um, from, from China as well. Um, they're usually, this is a process only done industrially. I've seen one other designer do small versions of these. Um, but uh, as you can tell on the left, I had lots of failed attempts at making water bottles. Um, they have to be heated to a very particular temperature and then blown like glass. Um, to kind of uh, produce that, that water bottle shape. Um, so it's kind of another deep process of mine and kind of artistic research is really getting into um, these industrial spaces, trying to understand how I can um, get to know these processes that are often out of our hands um, and inaccessible to us. But how do I get my hands on, on materials and sites and things that are held away, um, which is a kind of, kind of politic in the work. Um, yeah, so water bottles. I think I can talk more, but I wanted to leave just a little bit of time for questions. Um, yeah, and there's a lot more in that body of research about water and water systems. Um, but yeah, I think I'll pause there. The architecture in the first uh, video, what would it just first if it's thought very different architecture is modern? Yeah, that, that, um, the architecture became in a, a huge 
we've been thinking a lot about architecture and like the ways that it felt like certain architectures were almost meant to keep out dust or bubbles or yeah but the the modernist thing as well this kind of utopic <laughs> qualities of architecture uh, in a world that's meant to exclude other things um but yeah it was shot um a lot of that actually some of it's very weird some of it was um at this place uh, in Inner Mongolia called Ordos 100, which was a strange architecture art project that failed, and they were building these modernist test buildings out there. Uh, so when we were out there looking for dust in the desert, we kind of came across these and realized they were an Ai Weiwei project. Um, then a lot of them are often art centers, a lot in Beijing. Um, there are ones in Chicago. Yeah, there was the Olympic Center was the one with the data on the front. Um, yeah, quite a few of them are from China. Um, which is also kind of, I think, interesting and informs the piece, this kind of modernism that, that has migrated to China as well. Yeah, and then the weirdest one, I think, the interior, which isn't really an architecture, but the eco-dome, that, that was actually a cement factory um, that we, we got into with the triangles, the cathedral, crazy thing. Um, yeah, and the search for dust, cement was another <laughs> Uh, tangent, but that factory, uh, that's, that's actually how they've started um, covering the pet coke piles is with those same kind of domes um, to keep the dust from blowing. So they just close it and close it in these, again, very utopic kind of Buckminster Fuller <laughs> domes. So. Hey. Can you have a science fiction inspiration? Yeah, I have lots. Um, it's funny, actually, I look at artists, I often look at science fiction, so I got really interested in Robert Smithson's work, and he looked at this uh, writer from the 50s called J.G. Ballard, um, who's written some really interesting books, one called The Drought, that I really like. Um, but Ballard is kind of a legend of, of kind of mid-century uh, science fiction. I read a lot of science fiction as a kid, actually. Um, I'm not, certain books are not coming to mind. Um, at the moment, but I think science fiction, also in popular culture, has been so profound. I mean, Black Mirror, I think, is like one of the shows that I always talk about in my classes. Um, these influences, and I think there's just been like a plethora of science fiction, dark science fiction tales. Um, and I think, yeah, in that we really wanted to keep on an edge that engaged in, like, puts put its way towards the shadows, but hopefully stayed a little bit in the light. Um, so yeah, I'm always, if you have any recommendation, recommendations, I would always love more speculative uh, or science fiction. Uh, are there many artists who are into this ecological mentality? Yeah, yeah. Um, it really comes out of a lot of artists working in the 70s, 80s, 90s. Um, there's kind of, and actually Giovanni might talk about this in his next, le next lecture, but literally eco-art is a term um, that kind of emerged uh, around the 80s to really look at artists who are working um, directly and politically uh, with environmental causes. Jenny Kendler, who came as well as part of the series a while ago, deals with uh, environmental issues. So I think, yeah, it's been a, a growing kind of conversation in the arts as it has been grow a growing conversation in, in larger culture, um, what our environmental kind of issues are. And I think I've been really excited in how the environmental also butts the social. Um, I've been actually mostly reading anthropologists lately. Um, uh, and they've also been kind of looking a lot in environmental kind of justice issues as well, which I think is fascinating. Is there any cohesive group where people will join or belong or say, I want to know more about these people? There yeah, there's a number of books. I mean, I think there was one that came out on land art a while ago. There's a number of textbooks kind of on land art and eco art. Actually, if you just go on Amazon or any kind of um, major website and look up um, land art, eco art, um, I'm, I'm forgetting the exact names, but um, those are kind of the two, the two major movements that have been historicized at this point and really talked about. Um, I'm trying to think of other resources. Do you have any particular artists you like yourself? Yeah, my the ones I really love tend to come a little more out of um, the land art movement. Um, although some of them are edge on kind of eco art, maintenance art. Um, Robert Smithson, as I mentioned. Um, oh, Robert Smithson, as I mentioned, was a, a huge touchstone for me. Um, uh, Hans Hacke as well was part of this early. Um, not quite land art, it was between uh, environmental art and um, kind of social justice work. Um, that condensation cube I showed 
Um, Mira Latterman Euclid um, from the 80s uh, was kind of between women's work and environmental issues. She's been working on a lot of landfill projects lately. Um, those are the, the big names that are rising to the surface right now. Um, I actually, on my website, I do a lot of writing and I footnote a lot of people. So if you have, go to my website, I do have like a lot of people listed uh, since I also teach and I like passing on those references. Are there any other sci-fi inspired artists out there? Oh yeah. Let me think about that though for a second. Um, I mean, yeah, I think the word speculative has become, I think to just try and distinguish the way artists are looking at it from maybe the way entertain, and this is maybe my opinion, um, but the way uh, popular culture, entertainment, uh, I think definitely we call the genre sci-fi in the arts. I think maybe that word speculation or speculative um, futures uh, is one. And actually design as well is really, I mean, designers are always thinking about the future, right? Um, so these kind of speculations on, on what's going to come, what is happening uh, is a big, big kind of um, discussion in the design world. So I would say actually designers, to me almost, I see more kind of science fiction often coming out of architects and designers and um, people who are producing the future, um, which is also kind of really interesting to watch. Um, but yeah, I feel like also, yeah, there's Afrofuturism, there's just a lot, um, there have been a number of kind of different movements that really um, think about the future and the politics of the future um, through kind of science fiction and, and speculation.